Hey guys, how's it going? So in today's video, because it is 100 degrees outside today, I am up in our plant room where it's fully air conditioned and much more comfortable. And I thought it would be a good time to sit down and share some plans for next year. <laughs> so this video is typically one that I put together in January um, because I'm like full on thinking about uh, seeds, ordering seeds, organizing my seeds and planning uh, really actively for that season, that coming season. But since we are gonna have a baby in January and we will also have a toddler and we have a lot going on around here, I have been kind of preparing a little bit early. Also, it was a little bit hard to get seeds this spring and I know this spring was atypical, hopefully. Hopefully things are back to normal by next spring. Um, I just thought, you know what? I know some of the varieties of seeds that I want to get my hands on, um, either that I've grown before and they do awesome for me, or ones that I've really wanted to try. And so I just thought, you know, what? I already know what those things are, so I may as well get them ordered or get them picked up at the garden center and just make sure I have them so that I can fully focus on what I should be focusing on uh, in January and, you know, for the few months afterward where it's gonna be uh, pretty busy for us. So this is gonna be kind of a seed haul, if you will. I have a bunch of stuff from the garden center. That's usually how I start first. Um, and then I start ordering from other places. So I wanna show you all my new seeds. I also wanna talk about where I get most of my seeds because I do get asked that quite often. And then I will show you um, like what I have. These are what I have from this year. Um, most of which like I don't have a lot of full packets. They're just part packets. Um, one of these is labeled flowers. The other one is labeled herbs and veggies right here. And I find this system to be really effective. Um, and everybody organizes differently and this works for my brain. I'm gonna have to buy another one of these. These are CD, like CD cases from Staples. Um, and they're quite perfect because they fit, I mean, it looks kind of messy, but they fit out all the seed packets. And you know, seed packets aren't standard. Sometimes they're like real big and real tall and sometimes they're like normal size and then I get a lot in bulk too. So this accommodates all of those. And then I just cut my own little cardboard dividers and label them like annual flowers, perennial flowers, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what I'm gonna have to do with the third one of these that I get is um, have two flower bins and have them either be, and I don't know how this is gonna work out, but either be like um, all the seeds that need to be direct seeded in the ground will be organized by the date they need to be seeded and then alphabetized within that category. And then the other one will be date uh, seeds to sow inside and then organized by date and then alphabetized that way. That way my brain works better because it shows me from the very beginning of the tub what I need to be thinking about first in the year without having to get into all the rest of the business that's in these bins. Um, so these are fully alphabetized. I have gone through, I'm also gonna talk about my seed inventory. This usually isn't, I don't think it's necessary for maybe most, I, I don't know, maybe the average uh, gardener. Like I know when I was just doing my garden, my townhouse size garden, I didn't have near the amount of stuff that I was growing. So I could hold it in my brain a little bit better. I had far fewer seeds, but then a lot of us like to buy a lot of seeds because it's fun and it's exciting and you get to try new things and seeds keep forever. So, you know, you tend to hold on to like this hoard for a long time. So it's a good idea, at least for me, to get it down in a document, which we will show you. Um, and then now that I'm planting our big cut flower garden, which as you know, um, we planted it this year. It's done really well. I'm so thankful for how it's done. We also planted all of our vine crops out there, tomatoes, corn, I have fall crops going, I have dahlias, a big patch of sunflowers, and a, a plethora of other things. It's been a really good learning year, but we won't be gardening, most likely, in that spot next year. We'll be gardening where it's going to be put, like for permanent. Um, so I needed to know like how many of each kind of these seeds do I have so that I could plant accordingly because I'm not just planting a little three by four raised bed anymore. I'm planting like you know, 1,700 feet of sunflowers or 200 feet of corn. And, you know, I can know based on how many ounces of what kind of seed I have, how much I need in order to be prepared for next year, if that makes sense. So what I did for my seed inventory, we'll just go ahead and start there. I have two different sheets in within this. I use, just use Google Sheets. Um, I've got a veggies and herbs uh, sheet and then a flower cut flower sheet. Um, so what I did is I went through each one of these bins and I made sure they were all alphabetized. I put on the far left what type of plant it was. So like the type was artichoke. And then the next column is the variety. So I have green globe, 
artichokes and how the quantity, I put either part packet, full packet, or if they have an actual seed count, which I think every packet should have an actual seed count or a, an approximation, um, I put that information in there. I have not yet um, put in the, I have got a column that says reorder. Um, I haven't really gone through that yet, but that's kind of how I've started this seed inventory and I think it'll work well. You can see there I've got artichoke, beet, beans, cabbage, cantaloupe, uh, carrots, corn, cucumber, and so on, all the way down to watermelon. Um, and then in the cut flower section, and this one I have a lot more of like seed quantity, and this is really important, especially for the seeds that you're direct seeding in trays. Um, like I know that if I'm starting, let's say I've got 100 seeds of something, um, typically I do two or three seeds per cell, typically two. So I know that I have enough seeds to start 50 cells of that specific variety. Um, and that way I can say, well, do I really want oh, like 50 cells, that's a lot of plants, um, or do I want more of that particular variety? And then I can you know, adjust the amount and reorder if I need to and so forth. So you can see I have the same columns, I have the type, so you see amaranth there on the top, the variety, I've got coral fountain, hot biscuits, etc., and then the quantity that I have. Um, and I've got a lot of some, like asters. I have king size apricot, I have a thousand seeds, which I probably won't even go through next year. Um, I, a few of them I didn't realize I had, and this is why seed inventory is good. I didn't realize I had some of the king size apricot still, and I reordered more. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Like it's never a bad idea to have extra seeds, but so you'll notice some of them I have a lot of, but yeah, it goes all the way from amaranth all the way to zinnias here. And there's quite a few varieties I still have on hand, whether it means I have 10 seeds or a thousand seeds, it varies. So I hope it's helpful to see kind of how I'm organizing what I have here. And I just love the, like the fact that I know that it's all done. <laughs> Like, I don't even have to worry about it this winter, and I will still, no doubt, like once the garden center gets in their 2021 seeds, I will be down there looking at them because there's probably a few varieties I wanna pick up here and there. And when I do that, I'll just go ahead and enter them into my inventory so that I know I have those come planting time. But it's just a really quick way to look. Instead of like going through all these packets, I can go to the inventory and be like, oh, okay, I have seven different or six different varieties of China asters. And I think that's plenty. I think that's all I really want to grow of that. Or, you know, maybe you want more varieties of Asclepius, of milkweed. I've got two varieties on hand, you know, that and so forth. So um, now I want to talk about where I get my seeds. So first off, I always start at my parents' garden center first, just because we carry a lot of seeds that are good for our area. And we have a big, what's my favorite part down at the garden center? It's a wall full of seed bins that have been there. Well, they've been in that building since 1923. Andrew's seeds started in 1919 and uh, they moved to this, the location they're in right now in 1923. And it's been like a lot of it's the same. Um, and that seed wall has been the same. And so they've got 350 or 75 plus varieties of bulk seed all of which are really good for our area, which is so awesome. And they sell most of those online now too. Um, so when I go through these seeds, you'll notice they're not in like real pretty bags or anything like that. They're just in like straight up, oh, those are my garlic. <laughs> they're in uh, brown paper sacks, but that's how we roll when they come out of the bulk bins. If you were to order one of these online, you wouldn't get it in a envelope that looks like this for most varieties. Uh, you would get it in a really cute, they've got really cute envelopes and they always tie them with a little brown string and things like that. So most of these things, if you guys are interested, are available online as well as the ones here. So I always start with the ones from the garden center and then I have a few like go-to websites. Johnny Seeds, which is this right here, which is all of these right, right here. I don't even know how many are in there. There's a lot of packets. Let me count them. 101 seed packets to be exact. Anyway, Johnny's is probably my number one go-to because when you get seeds from them, all the seed packets look very plain. Like there's never any picture on them, but the amount of information you get, and you probably can't, I'll try to get a close-up of these so you can see, the amount of information you get on the back is invaluable. Like I have learned more about starting seeds from the back of these envelopes than I have ever seen. Like, and you don't have to Google and search around on different websites and pick up a little tidbit here or there. 
it's all on the back of the packet. Like I never even knew about top dressing some varieties of seed trays with vermiculite to help them not dry out so fast and help the seeds germ and it has been a game changer. You don't have to do that for everything, but they'll tell you stuff like that. Or like grow this plant on until you know it gets its first set of true leaves and bump it up into a bigger um, container and then move it somewhere cooler to let it grow on. I think that was delphiniums and foxgloves or one of the two. Anyway, I didn't know any of that. I would have just kept them all inside until, you know, they were ready to go. And I ended up putting them out in the greenhouse and they did so phenomenally well that I just, I, I feel like I owe a lot to Johnny's for some of the success that I've had. Um, the other place I order from is Floret Flower. You can get some really cool varieties of stuff from that website. Uh, they've got beautiful, just like beautiful everything. Like ch follow them, check them out on Instagram or Facebook. Um, they post all very, very regularly, beautiful varieties of things. Um, I got a lot of sweet peas there last year. I have poppies still. I have a few full packets of poppies that I never even got around to starting this year. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff from them. And they've got a beautiful photography and all that sort of thing. And then I have ordered a couple of things from Eden Brothers. Um, not many. I find that the information off their seed packets is a little spotty. Same with Baker Creek. Um, they have some really cool varieties that so Baker Creek does, some really interesting varieties of stuff um, that they, I think that they travel or have traveled or do travel all around the world and pick up these really interesting, unique varieties that aren't just your run-of-the-mill um, things. And I have some of their squash and pumpkins growing out in our garden right now. I've had the seeds for a while and they did really well. Um, so anyway, I'm trying to think of any other ones that I've ordered from regularly. I mean, I've ordered like a packet or something here or there from other people, but those are the ones I, I usually go to first. Okay, so I'm gonna get all of the stuff that's in this bag out and kind of organized and then we'll go through it. Okay, so the biggest things I have gotten so far, I've got a lot of um, smaller packets already organized in here, which I'll go through in a minute, but these are more of the, like the bigger items. So um, the one I really wanted to make sure I got was ambrosia corn. It's a bicolor corn. I think it's a 75 day. It's really sweet. It's what I planted out in our garden this year. I've got 250 feet of this right now and the ears are forming up beautifully. I planted it really late. I also planted a variety called sweetness. I, is it a bicolor? I can't remember. It's a 68 day and I planted that as a late summer crop. Well, it's going to be for early fall harvest. So I planted it in July and it's already up pretty good. So I should get some corn out of that as well. But ambrosia is my favorite. I haven't tried a ton of different corns out, but I always like to make sure I plant some of the stuff that I know I like really well. And then maybe a little bit of new stuff, kind of like the sweetness this year. Um, so I got a pound of that, which will plant roughly 400 feet. Now I won't plant that much probably next year unless I decide to produce more for other people and just if I've got some space and I just want to give some stuff away then I've got the seed to do that. Um, this whole line right here these are peas so Oregon sugar pod peas are my very favorite um, snow there's snow pea you can let them um, mature and you can shell them as well but I think they're really good in the young stage as a snow pea it's my favorite. Um, I find that they don't get tough um, I've grown a couple other varieties. Well, I've grown several varieties, but they're, they seem to um, get tough pretty quick and these stay so tender. I really do love them. Um, and I think that they have, like there's another variety in the bulk bins like called Early, it's early Gray. I, may, I, I can't remember. Anyway, um, they have a pink bloom and they're so pretty as opposed to a white bloom and the peas are good for a little bit, but it seems like they, they're just not quite as sweet and quite as tender. So I really like those. And then I also have some sugar snap pole peas. I always like to have some pole on hand um, in case I wanna utilize you know, some vertical growing room. Um, for garlic this fall, I'm gonna be using some of my own harvest of Italian garlic this year, which is my all time favorite. I've maybe tried uh, that I can remember trying, like and actually thinking about the flavor, maybe 10 or 15 varieties of garlic um, throughout the years. Italian just seems to be it's so good and it's so long, like it stores forever. Um, and it's always, it's just consistent and I really like it. But I'm gonna try a couple of new ones this year. Well, Susanville, I've grown that one before. I just can't quite remember what that one's like. And then I have the Germador, which I've also grown. These are a little bit different though they look. So look at this. Usually I'll wait and take a look at what they look like at the garden center before I decide if I want to grow them. If they look like really nice heads like this, I think, yeah, 
we'll give that a try. So that is the Germador. This one is the Susanville. So you can see this one is much more white in its skin and the Germador is much more purple. I think both of these are hard neck. Don't quote me on that, I'm not sure. So those are garlic, those will be going into the raised beds closer to the house, uh, probably next month at some point toward the end of the month. Uh, right here I have Kentucky, these are all beans right here. Kentucky Wonder Pole Beans, um, which are really good and stringless and they're tender. They're like a classic bean. And this variety is called Jade, which is a huge favorite around here. Um, they're really good for pro like uh, canning, processing. They're really good um, for just picking out of the garden and, and preparing for dinner. Um, they're just a really good bean. I used to love to grow, grow um, were they called like <sighs> royal purple or something. They were a purple bean. They would cook green, um, but they were purple on the, on the plant. So you could really see them easily, but we haven't had that seed for a while in bulk. And then I've got some Nash beans, which is an old timey variety. And then I've got two no name varieties. I actually had these on hand from this year. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't bother to write down what these were. So these will be surprise beans at some point. <laughs> I decide to give it a shot. Um, that's the, the, uh, one of the reasons why you need to be diligent about marking your stuff. Um, so that's what I have in terms of like the bigger quantity items out of the bulk bins. Um, and then I've got a ton of like cucumber, pumpkin, squash, and all of those, when you get them out of the bulk bin at Andrews, they look like this right here. Um, so, well, I think I had my finger over that, like the name of it. Um, and then, yeah, how much it is like half ounce or quarter ounce or that sort of thing. Um, so we'll go through those here in a second. So let me pack these back up and then we'll go through all the Johnny seeds. Actually, what I think we're gonna do, since I'm talking vegetables already, I'm gonna pull any vegetables that I got from Johnny's and then all the new ones from Andrew's out of my bin. And we'll go through those before we move on to cut flowers. Oh, man, it's kind of painful to pull all these packets out and jumble them all up right after I got done organizing them. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the ones that I got from the bins at Andrew's first, um, which are a lot. <laughs> and I'm just gonna rock through these things. So we're gonna, unless I have something uh, extra, I don't know, interesting about a certain variety, who knows. Um, but we'll try to pop a picture up so you guys can see. When I grow pumpkins and squash, we do eat quite a lot of mostly winter squash and I decorate with a lot of pumpkins and I'm planning on, typically I only grow enough for us. Um, I don't, didn't have as much room dedicated to them up to this point, to up to this year. So I would grow enough for me to store in our basement and then decorate one or two of our entry ways like our back door and our front door. Um, some years I only had enough to do one door. Uh, but now that I've got a bigger patch, I'm hoping to be able to amp up my decorating a little bit and then give some away, uh, that sort of thing. So that's my plan with all of these. So let's start with the pumpkins. We've got straight up jack-o'-lantern pumpkins, so a really good carving size. Howden pumpkins are also a really good kind of jack-o'-lantern carving type. Jack B. Littles are the little tiny orange ones. They're super cute. Sugar or pie pumpkins. If you're going to be making, you know, pie fillings or something like that, or for eating, this is a really good one. And they're kind of medium-ish, smooth kind of pumpkins. Cinderella's, which have been one of the better performers in my garden. They are amazing. They're like, they get really good size. A lot of them do, and they're more squatty and they're just super architecturally beautiful. Um, and they're very prolific performers. And then we have Big Max pumpkins, which are just big pumpkins. For winter squash, I don't grow a lot of summer squash because I don't really care for it all that much. Um, so like I'll grow some zucchini and I'll eat a little bit of zucchini, but I get tired of it really, really fast. And I don't grow really any other kind of summer squash. So these are all winter squash. We have sweet meat, which is a beautiful blue squash, super thick rind, stores for a very long time. Turk's Turban is a really unique one, and it's actually a really good one to cook with too, and it makes for an interesting presentation if you cut kind of like the top of the turban thing out. And it's they've got like a really beautiful mix of colors. So if you bake it like that, I had it once um, with a kind of creamy garlic soup, and you, so it's like a creamy garlic uh, brothy kind of thing, but thick, 
and then it was baked inside of a pumpkin or a squash like this and then you scrape out pieces of the squash and then you get that broth with the squash at the same time and oh my word so good make my mouth water right now <sighs> long island cheese is just a really pretty kind of palish pink slash tan colored squash autumn acorn blend acorn squash one of my favorite ones to cook with and this one comes with just like it produces a lot of different colors and then we've got buttercup squash which is also a good one to bake with i've also got in terms of vine crops i've got a couple of different melons so i've got hale's best jumbo cantaloupe which is an old classic variety and we've been selling that one forever and it just is a very consistent performer tuscany melons are one of my mom's favorite uh, cantaloupe type melons i don't know if you consider it a musk melon or a cantaloupe i can't remember but um, it's a really good one. I've got several seeds. I've got those started out in our uh, patch this year. The reason I can't gather a lot of my seeds this year is because I planted so many open pollinated varieties together. And while they'll come up true to form or true to their uh, variety type this year, they can cross pollinate. And next year, if I were to gather seeds from them, I don't know if I would get a true variety or if I'd get one of the parents or if I'd get some weird cross with something else. So I just erred on buying all of my seeds again. Um, and I'll probably do that every year because I, I, can't, I can't grow my vines far enough apart to make sure if they're open pollinated, to make sure that they don't cross. And the difference real quick, open pollinated seeds mean that if you were to grow, like let's say, I don't know which ones of these are open pollinated, but like, I don't know, if the sugar pie pumpkin is open pollinated and you plant this just kind of by itself out in the garden, then you can gather seeds from it and then plant them the next year. But if I planted this open pollinated, with another open pollinated, then they can, the bees, you know, when they pollinate and move around from flower to flower, they could cross these varieties and you could get something weird. Hybrid plants, um, don't do that. Hybrids you can't gather seeds from because you may, you won't probably get that same seed. So if you are in the business of wanting to save seeds, you just want to be careful about what you're planting next to each other um, and how far apart you're planting them uh, and so forth. Okay. The other vine crop I have, I've got a few crimson sweet watermelons. It's a really good water. We've got some gorgeous ones out in the garden. I wonder if I could run out and get a little picture of them. They're like this big right now and so pretty. I've got pickling cucumbers and uh, suyao long cucumbers, which are kind of like an English cucumber, except that they don't grow straight. They grow more curled, but they're very meaty. They don't have a lot of pulpiness in the center. And I like to make a lot of um, like Thai cucumber salad. And I like them to be very meaty. I don't like that softness in the center. So these are a really good one. Uh, and then I've got four different kinds of greens, butter crunch lettuce, which is one of my favorites, nice thick leaf. Marvel of Four Seasons lettuce, which I think is another type of butter crunch, isn't it? But it's got, um, it's also a thicker leaf um, and it's got a lot of red coloring to it. And Erin prefers spinach over lettuce but I think I, I get away with this one because it has that thicker texture and it doesn't like wilt very quickly, if that makes sense. I've also got the Giant Noble Spinach, um, which doesn't, it's got a, a smoother leaf. Um, so there's like Savoy type spinach, spinaches, which are um, more crinkly. They're really good. They're just a little bit harder to clean if you've you know, got a lot of dust blowing around like we do. Um, the Giant Noble Spinach has a very smooth leaf really good they also sell in the bulk bins the bloomsdale long-standing spinach which is really good too and it does have a smoother leaf and the thing i like about that one is it's a little slower to bolt when it gets hot outside so keep that in mind uh lacinato kale and dwarf blue curled scotch kale i'm actually going to grow these this fall i'm going to grow some of these other greens this fall too so i got extra like there's a bunch, way more than i could use in even two plantings i could probably get three plantings out of these um, so I'll be planting some of these greens as soon as it cools off a little bit. It's just too hot and these things need it cooler in order to germinate well. I have got white bunching onions, which I'm going to start this fall and then I'll save some for spring. Nantes carrots, which are a smaller, smaller type carrot, but they're really, really sweet and they don't develop that really woody core. Um, and so they're a really good one. And then a couple of different herbs, the sweet Italian basil. Um, which I grow a lot of the amazel basil and then I like to I actually grow five different types of basil in the cut flower garden just as filler plants because they do so well in bouquets you know being cut in fact they'll probably form roots inside the vase um, so I grew cardinal and Thai and uh, cinnamon lemon and 
am purple amethyst out there, um, but I do like to have some sweet Italian. I have some of that planted in my fall crops out there. And then a parsley called Gigante d'Italia parsley. So those are the ones that came out of the bulk bins at Andrews, and then these are the ones I ordered. So I always try to get all of the ones I want first and see what they have, and sometimes they'll get in some new stuff. Um, but typically the bulk bins kind of stay the same because they're just such good ones for us in our particular climate. Um, so we've got some specialty pumpkins here. I'm so excited about. And then I'm going to put them in pumpkin, squash, and melon categories here. I don't think I ordered more than one melon. This is called Savor. You know what? I'm going to pop my laptop top open just so I can remember if there's any details to share with you. This video is probably going to be such a beast so long. I'm sorry, guys, but I get excited about stuff like this. Like, just maybe bookmark this one for a winter day when you don't have as much going on. So what, what intrigued me about this one? Oh, it says it's the sweetest French melon. Uh, superb eating quality, two pound melon, so they're smaller type. Um, and they're real beautiful on the outside. They're white and they've got like darker greenish blue, uh, they call them sutures, I don't like that, stripes down them. And the flesh looks really deep orange and yummy. So savor melons. Uh, for winter squash, we've got the butterscotch. It's a hybrid butternut winter squash. Um, it sounded, well, I mean butterscotch. They get me with these names. It's probably similar to all the other butternuts I've grown. But butterscotch, mm, sounds good. I've got an acorn squash called Tip Top, which is apparently a better quality acorn squash. It's a larger fruit and better tasting. And I like the way it looks. So it looks almost, well, of course, they've got them all shined up and beautiful, but like the deepest green with almost like a metallic quality to it. That could be like what they shined it up with though. It's in the like, perfect light. I got two different types of kabocha squash. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, kabocha? Anyway, they were in the clearance section, so I thought, oh, I'll get a packet of each of these. So this one's called Shokichi Shiro, and they, it says that they're perfect for single servings, which I thought would be really fun to do some, like a soup situation where you slice the top off and you bake something inside it, or you stuff it full of rice and, you know, all kinds of yumminess in there. Um, my mom has made, she makes pot pies in pumpkins. Um, so she'll hollow out a pumpkin or a squash like this and put the pot pie filling in there and then put the crust top over the top, obviously. And she'll even like form the little stem of the pumpkin and bake them that way. And so when they come out, they smell amazing. The squash looks like beautiful. And so you can eat the pot pie filling along with a little bit of the squash wall. So there's an idea for you. So I've got Shokichi Green and so Shokichi Shiro. And then for pumpkins, the first one's called Winter Luxury. And the picture got me for this one. It's got like almost a glittery quality about it. And it did say in the description that it's got a really silky texture. So it's really good for pie making, which is interesting and really good for decorating as well because of the way it looks. There's a giant pumpkin called a polar bear, which is a bright white pumpkin that I guess maintains a really good color. And you usually get fruit that are between, what does it say? 30 and 65 pounds, but you only usually get one to two plant uh, fruit per vine. So that's something to consider too. A lot of this, like you get so much information from them. Um, it's really nice because you can plan, well, you know, I don't need a bunch of giant pumpkins, but I would maybe like to have six or something. So you know that I need to have at least three to six vines in order to produce what I need um, out of that specific variety. Then I've got Autumn Crown, which is a uh, Long Island cheese type of pumpkin. So it has that really beautiful kind of tannish colored uh, skin on the outside. And it says when you cut into these, they have kind of a melon smell to, to them. And they produce like three to five pumpkins per vine, which is pretty good. Of course, these aren't like giant, like the polar bears are just these giant, giant fruit so you really do have to have a lot of vine to feed something that gets that big when you have things that stay a little bit smaller of course they're going to produce a little bit more a pumpkin called speckled hound and this one it looks really interesting it kind of looks like a splatter painted pumpkin i had splatter painted walls for a few years in like my middle school days and it was uh, like purple and green i think over white oh my goodness um, anyway, this kind of has that same kind of vibe to me. It's more of a squatty type pumpkin. It's kind of a pinkish orange and then it has the faintest of sage green kind of splotches down. It's really interesting looking. Um, 
I don't know if it says yellow, orange, thick, dense flesh with dry matter. So I don't know like how this one would be to eat with necessarily, but it looks beautiful to decorate with. I ordered more flat stackers, which are a flat white uh, pumpkin. We, my mom and I both like to make the stacks, you know, the pumpkin stacks out of different colors, like a Cinderella and then a flat stacker and then maybe a sweet meat. So you've got an orange, a white, and then a blue pumpkin or a blue squash in a stack. It's really pretty. I have these growing outside right now, but I wanted to make sure to have more. The next one is called Musque de Provence. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I have them growing outside right now. They're gorgeous. Like, they are so, so pretty. They're uh, kind of a, they're an orange, but they're a muted orange. It's not like a bright orange jack-o-lantern. And they have really thick flesh. So they're really long storing, which is wonderful. And I was reading up on the website on this one and it said that um, th these are often sold in wedges at markets in France. And they're kind of a mainstay over there with a moderately sweet flesh. Casparita is a little white pumpkin, really fun to decorate with. 15 to 20 fruits per plant on this one. This one I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce. We'll put the name on the screen. Anyway, it's a slate gray colored pumpkin, really thick flesh again, really long storing, really good for eating, really good for decorating with. The next one is Porcelain Doll, which is a pink pumpkin. Um, and I guess this one has a pretty good resistance to powdery mildew if you deal with that. I don't deal with it very badly here. Occasionally we'll get some powdery mildew. I had some on some roses and Veronica this year, but not really much on my pumpkins. It's so dry here all the time. Um, but if you are in a moist, humid climate and you need something that's a little bit better to stand up to that, this one's apparently good. But I like the description on this one. It says, add diversity to fall ornamental displays with the unique color of porcelain doll. The sweet flesh can be used for pies, soups, and other gourmet delights. Full vines bear blocky, deeply ribbed fruit, averaging 16 to 24 pounds. Holy moly. Two to three fruits per plant. See, it's kind of uh, timely to be talking about pumpkins at least. A lot of us don't have them like ready to pick yet, but you know, it's kind of exciting to talk varieties. I actually did notice online uh, too, uh, there's been a lot of talk about seeds. I noticed several people posting like, hey, are you guys ordering seeds now or are you gonna do it in the winter? And I saw a lot of people saying that I'm gonna do it now because I wasn't able to get what I wanted um, last spring. So anyway, that's another reason why I thought this would be a good a good time just to throw this video out there. Last pumpkin is called the Valenciano, which is the whitest pumpkin that this company at least offers. Um, it says snow white skin, unique for doorstep decorations and for painting. Uh, and the, it's good for pie making. So that kind of sums up the vegetables for now. My word. I'm going to clear these off and get my flowers all set up now. Okay, so for the flowers, since I have so many, I am just going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, and then we'll probably put a list down below this video as well. And I'll just stop if there's anything that I've had particularly good luck with in the past or if there's anything interesting in particular. So I think I kind of want to start with uh, zinnias. Where are my zinnias? Because zinnias, zinnias are easy. If you have never started any flowers from seeds, start with zinnias because you will not be sorry. So we've got Oklahoma white, queen lime with blush. Oh, so pretty. I have those growing out in the garden right now. And they're just the perfect thing because you can add them into so many different color um, palettes. Like you don't, you know, when you have something that's like bright fuchsia, it's really hard to mix that in with like orange you know, or something that looks very jarring, but I love the ones that kind of can lend either way. Queen Red Lime is the same way. I have that one growing this year as well. The Benaries, 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 Giant Salmon Rose. I did not grow this year, but I grew last year. Um, huge coral, like salmon, pink colored zinnias. Zinderella Peach is a really interesting one because the center comes up, like up further than the petals that kind of face, they face out, not down, like an echinacea out and then the center kind of bulbs up and then it has this row of little tiny petals around it. It's really interesting and a beautiful peachy, almost with a yellow tint to it. And then Queen Lime Orange, which is a really beautiful one. Um, I just used that in, I actually used that one in the very first arrangement I ever made out of the cut flower garden. We put that video up last week. Okay, so now Lysianthus. I grew the uh, Voyage 2 Champagne this last year. It was my very first time growing Lysianthus from seed. I started them in January, so it's very likely I will not get to these this year. 
but I wasn't able to get any of the Voyage Champagne because they, I think they had a, a crop problem or they didn't have enough stock. I ordered them, but I just got an email saying that the order was canceled and I needed to substitute because I couldn't get those seeds. But I have the Roseanne Deep Brown, beautiful color, and the Dublini White, which I think is very versatile. So I started them in January. It took 16 full days, full long days, to see even the tiniest bit of green germination. And then it took them several days after that for them all to start coming up. I had fairly good germination uh, rate come up from them. Uh, and these are pelleted because they're such tiny seeds. Um, and then it took forever for them to grow, forever. They were not ready to plant out until May. I mean, five months in their seed trays. And I didn't get them out until mid-June. And even then they were tiny. But once I got them into the ground, they took off and they have done so, so well for us. Super, super, I mean, if you are patient and you don't mind just having a seed tray sitting there that's not gonna like move very quickly, it's not like a fast moving crop, then Lysianthus is a good one. Uh, the only extra basil I ordered because I have plenty of the other ones is the Amethyst Improved variety. And I don't love the flavor of the purple basil. That's why I keep it in with my cut flowers because I grow it as kind of a cut flower filler. A flashback mix calendula, just a beautiful, bright, mix of calendula colors, easy to grow, um, and they host aphids actually. So, I mean, you kind of want, want to watch them a little closely out in your garden if you have aphid problems typically, but I kind of like to have them out there. The, these in Nicotiana for me, if I have those in the garden, aphids will not bother anything else. They will all go toward the calendula and Nicotianas, and then I don't have to spray anything so long as I'm okay having some plants affected. Uh, Celosia, I planted the Selway terracotta this year, had crappy germination, <laughs> crappy germination. Um, I ordered more. It says 95% germ rate on this. It could have been user error, I suppose, but I had pretty good luck with everything else, um, except for the Bengal Rose Frost Asters from Botanical Interests. I bought some of those seeds at the garden center. I had to buy two, ended up buying two packets because I had such poor germination from the first packet, but Terracotta is a beautiful terracotta orange, unique looking bloom. And then I got some Selway white this year to try out and I'm hoping for better luck this next time. Uh, I did pick up more amaranth. I planted some of those in the video recently in July where I planted 10 things you could still plant mid season and get flowers. I planted amaranth along one of the fence lines. And the thing about these seeds is that you do have to keep them uncovered. They don't, they wanna be barely covered with anything because they need light in order to germinate and I did not um, tend to them like I should have, and I had one come up, one out of the entire row. I planted three varieties, but I think what happened is I kind of barely covered them with soil, and then I ran the drips to that area for a really long time, um, and I think the seeds just kind of floated away. Uh, so it's one of those things, I think when I do this next time, this is a good learning experience, I think I will put these to where I can monitor them separately from everything else. Uh, but I've got Coral Fountain, Emerald Tassels, Red Spike, and Hot Biscuits. A uh, Scabiosa, or do you say Scabosha, or just Pincushion Flower? I started some from seed this year, the Fama White, Fama Pink. Um, is it Fama Blue, maybe? Fama Lavender, I can't remember, but super easy to grow from seed. And they're blooming their heads off out in the cut flower garden right now. So I ordered more Fama White, Snow Maiden, and Black Beauty. Uh, the China Asters, I've had such great luck, except for the Bengal Rose Frost variety. I've had amazing success with those out in the garden. And it was one that like, I don't think that they recommend pinching, like they don't need to be pinched. They just like grow and branch out and produce these massive flowers that last forever. Um, so I have next year coming Tower Violet. Tower, how do you say that? Shem, Shemwa. Chamois. I'm going to go with that. It sounds fancier. Ta Tower Chamois. Uh, Lady Coral Lavender. King Size Apricot has been a fantastic variety for me this year. And Tower Blue. Those looked like such specialty flowers to me that I was a little intimidated to start those from seed, so I was really happy about that. I do have a few ornamental kale that I'm going to be starting. There's Crane White, Crane Pink, and Crane Red. I think I'm a little bit too late. Maybe not. I think I'm a, I'm a little too late to start them this year, but I think it'll be fun to have these for spring or even save and do for next fall, which is likely. For sunflowers, now I get a lot of sunflowers from the garden center. In fact, um, I think I've got some here. 
large gray striped sunflower. It's just that I like to get large quantities of these. These are the autumn beauties. Um, I get the, let's see, I get California giant zinnias in bulk. These are the velvet queen sunflowers. Um, so I get all a lot of most of my varieties from the garden center, but there's some specialty ones. There's one called pro cut plum, which I'm incredibly enamored with. Uh, it's the first one to start blooming out there. It's a really tall one. Like it's definitely taller than I am. Um, beautiful kind of medium sized blooms that have like a really muted yellow on the outside that kind of graduates into a plummy color. They are so beautiful um, and just prolific. There's a branching sunflower called lemonade, a branching sunflower called Florenza, a red hedge, which is another amazing one I'm growing this year. Uh, it's got even darker colored stems and then deep, deep red blooms. Pro Cut Lemon, I have those blooming outside right now as well. And it's a, um, it's another taller, it's not getting quite as tall as my other Pro Cuts uh, so far, but a beautiful lemony color. And then Pro Cut White Night, which is a white sunflower with a dark center. It's really beautiful. I think I have those out there as well, but I don't, they're not blooming yet. I think I will have to fill and order some sunflowers if I decide to grow as many. And I was just thinking like, oh, sunflowers and pumpkins are both so easy to grow. Like they don't require hardly anything for me and they give back so much. So I'll probably be ordering a few more specialty varieties. In terms of sweet peas, I've got a whole bunch of them. I have gathered a lot of seeds from my sweet peas this year. Uh, so I have those as well, but I've got one called Midnight. Old Times, which is an amazing variety, you guys. It's probably the most fragrant one that I had out there this year. And it's kind of like a, a mix of yellow, like really pastel, light white, yellow, pink, and kind of a bluish purple. The Spencer Ripple Formula Mix is another beauty. Blue Ripple will be a new one for me this year. Nimbus, Elegance Salmon Rose. I grew some of those this year. I, they came out of it. I can't remember if they were like a Fairy Morris or something. Anyway, they came out of a different packet and they came up in a total mix of colors. So I got some salmon and there were some dark colored ones and some blue ones and some red ones. It was really or kind of like a reddish pink. It was a really fun mix of color, but I was kind of expecting all salmon. So that's one called Mars and then Wiltshire uh, Ripple. Also incredibly easy to start from seed inside so you can get a head start outside with those. Uh, gomfrina, I'm planting a Audrey White, super easy. These, the Gomfrina I had hit and miss luck with germination, but honestly these plants get so big that I'm kind of almost happy I didn't get as many as I had intended on planting. Um, I mean, you guys know how truffula pink grows. They don't grow quite as vigorous as truffula that gets like this big, but um, these still get good size and produce a ton of blooms that maintain their color even when dried. So you can use them very, in a lot of different applications. So more Audrey Whites this year for sure. And then a new one um, that's an orange color. I'm gonna do a Magic Fountains Mix Delphinium. I started the Magic Cherry Blossom, Magic Fountains Cherry Blossom this year. Totally came up way lighter in color than the picture shows. Still beautiful, but very easy to start from seed. Um, I'm gonna do Craspedia, the Sunball again this year. They are um, just starting to bloom right now out in the cut flower garden. They actually got mealy bugs inside. Um, and they have the kind of structure to where the leaves come up from the center, like the center crown, and they're very um, like tight. So their mealy bugs can get in there very, very easily. So I had to monitor those really closely and I had toothpicks up here and I just picked the mealy bugs out and I eventually got on top of them. Um, so other than that, it's been super easy because they like drier conditions. They're pretty easy to grow that way. Um, silvery blue foliage and then a bright yellow spherical shaped bloom. We're gonna do more Ruby Moon Hyacinth beans, super fast and easy to grow. Uh, Bells of Ireland, which I grew in the water jugs with the winter sowing method, but I never got around to actually seeding some. So I have a part packet and then this one here. Uh, Mahogany Splendor Hibiscus. Uh, this one was impressive. It was one of my favorite ones to come up to this plant room and see growing because it's so beautiful and deep red and beautiful like maple, Japanese maple shaped leaves. Um, I haven't cut a lot of it. 
It says, for cut foliage, harvest once leaves are mature, not tender, and stems are straight, firm, and at least slightly woody, which could be my problem. I may have cut my first little batch when they were too young, and they wanted to wilt right away. I also thought it could have been due to the fact that it was 102 outside, but um, even if I don't grow these for cutting next year, I'm gonna definitely grow them to pop around in flower beds because I think they're a really fun alternative to coleus. Uh, for snapdragons this year, which are super easy fr from seed, uh, Costa Silver, Madame Butterfly Bronze with White, which will probably be my all-time favorite. Madame Butterfly Bronze, which is very similar, but I like the white one almost a little better because it's a little less in your face color-wise. And Madame Butterfly Bronze is a, a much more uh, bright just because it doesn't have that white kind of mixed in to kind of mellow it a little bit. We've got Costa Apricot, two of those, Potomac Lavender, and Madame Butterfly Yellow which will be a fun one to have a yellow snapdragon out there. I've got a couple different kinds of larkspur, misty lavender and fancy pink, fancy pink with white to be. I grew some larkspur this year. They all came up. They're actually blooming in trays behind the barn right now. <laughs> they're, they're blooming in their original seed trays. I have three trays back there that I just didn't get around to planting and there's something flying around me right now. Anyway, um, yeah. Some things just got away from me a little bit because this spring has been a little tender with a little bit of morning sickness. So you know what, it, it's okay. Some years are just gonna be like that. Rudbeckia is an amazing plant to start, you guys. So we've got Sahara, which I have growing out there now. Uh, Prairie Sun, beautiful yellow. Cherry Brandy is one of my favorites. I love that one. It's like a, I actually bought two, two packets of those. Um, they are kind of a red, but like more of a burgundy. They have a little bit of pink in them. So they're on the cooler side of red and you can use them um, in, they look so beautiful in fall arrangements. I've got one that I've never grown before called Chinese Forget-Me-Nots. And these looked really pretty. Like they are Forget-Me-Not colored flowers, but bigger of course. And they come on really long stems. Um, they are a maturity day of 75 to 85 days. So I'm wondering if I could get away with doing two crops of these. I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, but they're actually really good for uh, beneficial like pollinators and stuff to bring a lot of these are good for pollinators to bring them in I've got a columbine called Barlow mix, which is a clematis type columbine and they're beautiful I've seen these are perennial so these and I'm excited to grow some stuff in our like permanent area Because I could actually put some cut flat like roses out there I could do some rows of stuff like that that I could just like pick from every year and not have to worry about you know like everything in our space right now is all annual, so I don't have to, well, I'll have to dig the dahlia and uh, gladiolus bulbs up and that sort of thing, but everything else just dies at the end of the season, so I don't have to worry about transplanting any perennials or anything, but these are beautiful. It's a beautiful mix of colors. Um, I'm not sure, let's see, do I start this inside? Yeah, it says it's recommended to start inside and you start them eight to 10 weeks before last frost. That's why I think it's gonna be so nice to organize all the flowers based on the calendar year <laughs> you know like what do i need to be thinking about in january what am i going to be doing in february and that sort of thing um so that you know if i get off like in january like let's like say i have lisianthus in there and whatever else i don't think anything else needs to be started that early but um that month might just get put aside because we'll be so busy and february might too but it's easy because then the next year i can go to that section and it's all ready for me We've got some Love in a Mist, Nigella, Nigella, Albion Green Pod, beautiful, I've got Albion Black Pod too. So those are grown, I mean, they've got pretty flowers, but they're grown more for their pod after they're done blooming. And they're really interesting to use as a textural element. And then we've got one called Delft Blue. This one is a Bupplerium, Bupplerum, called Green Gold, and it's a filler type plant, filler flower. It's like a foliage kind of accent. Um, and it's really good for drying as well. I've got a few different varieties, or maybe just two varieties of Atriplex, which um, it's also known as Auric or Aura. Oh, timers just went off <laughs> for the lights. Hold on. There we go. So I think, is it a type of mountain spinach? I just planted an Atriplex in my raised beds outside. Um, anyway, it does say that the leaves are edible, but the seeds or the seed heads that these produce are absolutely beautiful. Um, I, pl I planted some of these in our winter sowing uh, in the water jugs as well. And I have beautiful, in the, in the greenhouse, it's still in the water jug. 
beautiful long stems with these like shimmery looking seed pods on the top. That's one thing I'm kind of lacking out in the cut flower garden this year are fillers. I have the basil going and I have the hibiscus, but that's pretty much it. Everything else is flowers, but there's plenty in the garden over here to cut as fillers, tree branches and such. Another new one to me is this Amobium called Winged Everlasting, which look like itty bitty daisies and they're supposedly good for cut and drying. These seeds must be tiny. I think they're in an envelope inside this envelope. There's three different kinds of feverfew, which produce these beautiful little dainty flowers, really good for fillers. Um, and then one of them is kind of like the Crespedia, so it's got a yellow spherical shaped bloom, but I think it's maybe on longer stems and they're a little bit more wispy. So we've got one called Magic Single. There's the Vegmo Sunny Ball and Magic Lime Green. Uh, for stock, which is an earlier season bloomer, I still have some stock going out in the garden and the poor things never really did that well this year. They were easy to grow in their trays. Um, I put them out when it was really hot and they were really um, leggy by the time I put them out. And I got some really long, nice blooms, but the plants themselves were like all flopped on the ground. And so the stems were shaped kind of like it would grow on the ground for a little bit and then it would kind of come up with the bloom. So they were really easy, like you could use them as a trailer kind of element out of your bouquet, but hopefully next year I have better luck. But we've got Cat's Apricot, which I grew this year, Iron Purple and Iron Yellow. A marigold called Nocento Lime Green, which I've never grown before. I've grown marigolds. In fact, I've got a beautiful stand of marigolds I planted from seed going right now. So this will be a fun color to add. I've got three varieties of Ami, is that how you say it? A-M-M-I. One's called Dara, beautiful disc shaped blooms. Um, and this variety has a mix of like deep burgundy pink and kind of a creamy pink color. And then there's green mist, which of course is more of a chartreuse green colored bloom. And then white dill, which is a white bloom. Um, the other name, well, the green mist isn't necessarily chartreuse green. I don't know. It's a, like a white with a hint of green. Anyway, the um, other names, this is also known as false Queen Anne's lace, lace flower, false bishop's weed, toothpick weed, and bishop's weed. Doesn't look anything like the bishop's weed that I'm familiar with, but these are really wonderful, wonderful uh, filler plants, filler flowers, because they are pretty good size and they're just so um, wispy and elegant looking. And then their foliage, of course, looks like dill. I've got white finch orlea, which is also known as the white lace flower. It's also a kind of white um, filler type flower. Uh, when I look at the picture of it, it looks like an iris, but on a very long stem, like a. Um, Iris is a white blooming, I can't remember the botanical or the common name for Iris. It'll come to me later. Anyway, um, it's beautiful in the spring. It's kind of a ground cover, but these look like those clusters of white blooms or maybe even like a pink cushion flower bloom, but on long stems. I'm really excited about this one. It's called Kiwi Blue. It's a type of honeywort. Uh, the botanical is Cerinth, Cerinth, I don't know how to say that. Anyway, um, it's got really beautiful blue blooms and then like this really beautifully colored foliage. It's like a silvery green blue. I don't know. It's just a wonderful almost filler flower. It's not a really bold looking flower, um, but it's really good to have as an accent. And I think I actually have some of these. I might have more of these in there and I meant to plant them and didn't get around to it. Um, but they're also really good for bees and hummingbirds. Ooh, two, two left. Uh, cosmos that I'm going to do for next year. I've got some other Cosmos left from Florette from last year, but I've got Fizzy White, Double Click Snow Puff. These are really cool looking. And Afternoon White. A lot of whites there. I must have had a lot of colorful ones left. And the very last one is a Clarkia called Elegant Salmon. So really long um, stems that have kind of the panicle type blooms like almost like a foxglove or a delphinium, which I'm a huge fan of that type of bloom anyway, but these are like a really vivid salmon pink color. Um, they're really, really pretty. I'm excited. These are supposed to be a hundred seeds in here. Like I always wonder sometimes about like, really? How in the world? Yep. Whoa. Those are tiny, really tiny. Always a pleasure to plant the tiny ones. So that is pretty much it for this video today. I just thought it would be a good opportunity because it's so hot out and like you should see it. We've had some uh, really bad lightning storms in the area lately and there's some wildfires and 
Uh, it is so, it looks miserable. It's just the sky is brown and I can't even see the hills around this area. Usually I can see the hills out where my parents live and I can't even see them. They're not visible at all. So it's kind of a miserable day out there. And honestly, like the seed inventory was kind of fun to work on because we've had a few weeks of over 100 degree temperature. So I'll do work in the morning outside. And then I came in and spent a couple afternoons just pouring through my seeds and putting together the inventory. It was really fun and it almost reignited that excitement again, which I need this time of year because I'm feeling tired. Um, some plants are looking tired out there. I mean, we had uh, winds between 60 and 70 miles. I can't remember what mile per hour they actually clocked in at, but um, between 60 and 75, uh, 70 miles an hour the other night for about 15 minutes, and you should have seen the dirt. I mean, it's just like everything is covered in dirt right now. So if I can think about fresh plants and spring, which is one of my favorite times, it's always fun. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. Um, I hope it was helpful in any way, maybe just seeing how I organize or who I order seeds from. We'll link all the stores. So we'll link my parents' garden center, Johnny Seeds, Florette Flower. Those are my top three, usually the, my go-tos. Um, and then I will see if I think I can just copy and paste my list from my inventory in the description so you can see what my inventory looks like. So anyway, thank you guys again so much for watching this video and we will see you in the next one. Bye.